All right. Um, my name is Ian Beyer. I am CWE number 273. And find the right button here. There we go. Um, I currently work as a field engineer for wireless learning solutions with uh, Rick and Scott and their team. Um, I, uh, I got my CWE this year, uh, 51 weeks after passing my first P level test. And I submitted my application 51 weeks after passing my CWNA. So it was kind of a, a cool timing thing. Um, I'm also certified with ECAHOW, Air Magnet, IB Wave. Um, I think that just means I'm certifiable. Uh, I don't collect certifications to the rate that you do, Keith, but you know, you've got a bit of a head start on me. So um, just wanted to give you a quick disclaimer. The project I'm talking about is not one I actually did with WITS. Uh, it was one that I did at a previous employer this spring before I joined the team. Um, so I'll, I'll be talking in terms of the partner relationships we had with, with that uh, employer. And um, so um, we, we all have vendors that we're used to working with. And kind of after a while, you, you get used to, um, used to the various things that, that they do and the various quirks. And um, what happens when you get a new player in the market that makes a convincing case for their product, and it actually meets some uh, customer needs that you've got. Um, turns out that there are a whole bunch of little things that after you've worked with a vendor for a while, you just kind of start taking for granted uh, when you've installed the same gear over and over. So I think you know where this is going. Um, kind of like. So uh, there are a lot of dangers and pitfalls when you venture into the unknown. Uh, map makers of, of old days would mark the unknown portions of their maps uh, with the, the words, here be dragons, usually in Latin, uh, and I'm not even going to attempt to murder this. Um, but these dragons were usually, usually shrouded in mist, and eventually somebody would venture into that mist and discover that there weren't any dragons there after all, and the maps would get updated. So what is mist? Um, it's, um, there we go. Technical difficulties. Uh, well, there's no dragons. Um, maybe if we did some inter API integration using Elon Musk's flamethrower. Uh, Bob, is there API support for this? Um, I, I think I've got an idea for your AP terminator function. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail too much about MIST. Bob did a pretty good job of uh, what was the back end on that. Uh, if you really want the gory details, the folks at MIST uh, will be happy to talk, to talk about it, I'm sure. Um, but I, I think what MIST is doing is one of the more interesting things I've seen come down the Wi-Fi pipe since, um, since Ruckus came out with their antennas about a decade or so ago. Uh, if you live in the Cisco world, you'll probably find that there are a lot of physical similarities um, between the, the MIST APs and the, uh, the Cisco 4800s. So, so let, let, let's, let's review a little bit the, uh, the OSI model. Um, it has seven layers, like a burrito. Did, did you all have the guacamole at lunch? Um, so this is, um, th this is the layer, that, the, the seven layer model that we've, we've come to know. Uh, I'm gonna expand a little bit on this one. And there are a couple layers on the extended model that we're familiar with, the uh, layer eight and layer nine issues that we're familiar with. Um, and then lesser known is layer 10. I'm not talking about church here. I'm talking about iOS, Android, AP on a stick versus predictive, um, Windows versus Mac. So um, I'm gonna extend this model one more. Um, because there's one thing that's missing here. The, uh, the logistical model, or the logistical layer. And I, I'm gonna put this down at layer zero because it, it kind of underlies all the rest of it. It's, it's where all the nasty stuff that goes underneath that physical layer. The, the stuff that those of us who do engineering tend to forget because this is where things get messy. Now, you remember the burrito? Um, layer zero, the logistical layer, that's the tortilla. Because without that tortilla wrapping the whole thing, all you've got is a giant mess on your hands. So for a lot of engineers, layer zero is kind of unknown territory. So welcome to 
the dragon lair. Come on. So uh, this project was a church in uh, suburban Indianapolis. Um, I know you're probably wondering, okay, what, what do you need Wi-Fi for in church? And my, come on. Um, a lot of um, mobile IT workers, um, classrooms, guest Wi-Fi, um, applications. There's, uh, there's a church in Oklahoma City that uh, about 10 years ago published an application that includes every single known translation of the Bible, and it has seen 350 million downloads in 10 years. And this is being used increasingly in churches uh, by preachers rather than keeping um, pew Bibles, things like that, um, just because these rooms have flexible seating and sometimes it's not particularly practical. Um, Wi-Fi in church is kind of a hot topic right now. Uh, a lot of churches have deployed their Wi-Fi in what is charitably described as an ad hoc manner. Uh, we all know that 802.11 is fairly forgiving of uh, bad implementation, but the, um, the, the limits of that forgiveness are becoming more and more apparent as these networks grow and overall Wi-Fi usage increases. Uh, they've committed a lot of Wi-Fi sins in this process, um, largely from a combination of lack of knowledge and um, a tendency to sacrifice quality on the altar of cheap. Um, it's a fairly dangerous combination, and um, it's, uh, it's one that's become uh, altogether too common. So churches present an interesting environment for a Wi-Fi designer. Uh, some of it is a high-density, large public venue. Um, you know, we're talking auditoriums that can be anywhere from 500 seats to 5,000 seats. Uh, some of it is run-of-the-mill office space. Some of it is, uh, is classrooms. And other areas, it's childcare areas, which need some basic coverage, but they don't need a whole lot of performance. Um, so you've got a whole bunch of these different environments that we're used to as designers, but they're all kind of thrown together. And you have to be able to use all these different tools to maximize that design without it costing a fortune. Um, because this is, this is a nonprofit, they're working on donated money, and any ex expenditure has to demonstrate um, pretty clear value to the, uh, to the organization. Um, of course, usually in churches we have to deal with uh, volunteer committees and sometimes what a church considers urgent when it comes to deploying Wi-Fi uh, can end up taking months, and this is definitely a, uh, a constant layer eight, layer nine problem. Um, this didn't happen here. Um, we were approached in late February by the church's IT director who said, we want to do a major Wi-Fi upgrade in our environment, and oh, by the way, can you get it done by Easter? Now, if you don't participate in the Christian faith, uh, let me point out that there are two high holy days that you may have heard of. One is Easter, the other is Christmas. That is the Super Bowl. Uh, People who never show up for church any other day of the year will show up on these two days because they feel, okay, maybe I need to do this. And so, did I mention it was late February? Do y'all remember when Easter was this year? April 1st. That's five weeks. I hadn't even done a design yet. They just said, hey, we need Wi-Fi. So, okay, that's not too bad. Uh, I work out of my home office in Kansas, and the installation site was in Indianapolis. And so I got to travel to make this happen. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that particular uh, aspect of our line of work. Um, here's where we get an additional complication. Uh, not only am I doing this for a church, my wife is clergy. I said how Easter is the busiest day of the year. Um, there's a whole week leading up to it that is uh, particularly busy. Uh, which means that those of us that are married to clergy uh, are on a strict no-fly travel ban that week. Uh, otherwise, the kids end up unsupervised and go feral, and nobody wants that. So I'm done in four weeks. Okay, that's not too bad. I, I, I can handle four weeks. Well, knowing Holy Week was coming up, the week prior was our school district spring break. Uh, we'd planned a week on the beach. Um, a few days beforehand to, to pack and get ready and drive there. Uh, we weren't going to fly because those of you who have kids know how expensive that gets. Um, so now I'm down to two weeks. And that includes designing the network, includes getting the APs, and it includes actually hanging them. 
I'm starting to get anxious about this. So, so we talked to the church and the IT director there and uh, decided to make a compromise that we would install the APs in the uh, auditorium and make sure that there's good Wi-Fi for the Easter services uh, so, and the rest of the building could come later. So that gave me a little bit of, of breathing room. So why was getting that Wi-Fi working in the sanctuary so important? Because it sucked. Um, I don't know if you see those APs on the sides. Those were zip-tied to metal catwalks above metal grating that was roughly a uh, half wavelength wide, uh, about 10 meters above the APs. That little uh, stealthified access point was hiding behind a bunch of audiovisual equipment. And these three APs were all that was covering the 1700 seat auditorium. Um, the reason for this was that the customer, uh, before they had acquired some knowledge, bought into the vendor marketing on the APs that said uh, things like high density and supports a thousand clients. I'm sure you guys have heard this as well. Those of you that are vendors in this room, stop doing that. Um, so <laughs> now, the design requirement here was really simple. They said, we want Wi-Fi that doesn't suck. Now, I can work with that. So we, we talked to them about Ruckus, um, which is fairly well established in this market. Um, we talked to them about the missed solution, whether there was any hope for redeeming their unified network. There wasn't. Um, and we also talked about Meraki because they were already using that for their uh, switch infrastructure. Um, they said, go ahead and give us a clean sheet design. Don't try to retrofit what we've got. And so I, I worked on that and, and came up with a couple of solutions for them. We talked to them a little bit more about the, the missed solution. And um, they decided that, okay, this, this kind of works. Um, one of the things that they saw in it was the, um, the Bluetooth location stuff. They weren't going to implement that right away, but the communications people were pretty excited about that. And the IT staff saw an opportunity to reduce their workload and not necessarily have to hire an extra person to, to deal with uh, Wi-Fi, even on a part-time basis. Um, so despite the, uh, the licensing costs, uh, it, was, it was cheaper than hiring another person, and uh, it, it gave them a lot of... Um, it, was, it was a force multiplier for it. So once I nailed down the preliminary account in a vendor, uh, we said about finalizing the design. Uh, we, did, we did this in Ekahau. One of the really fun things about dealing with a church, especially one that is growing rapidly, is that while on the outside it may look like one building, it's actually about six buildings that have just kind of grown over time. In this particular one, there were several outdoor walls that were now indoor walls and that had some just nasty attenuation. Uh, even right in the middle of the office, uh, if you see down there on the bottom left corner, there was kind of that extension that was added to it later. So, so I, had to, I had to contend with this. Um, Fortunately, this church had a uh, display in one of the public areas that showed the process of this, being, this church being built over the years, uh, which included construction photos. So it was kind of like having x-ray vision as to what the inside of this building was actually like, which was a tremendous help. Um, I discovered that the new uh, sanctuary was built with tilt-up concrete uh, panels, which as far as 80211 is concerned, that is a no-fi zone. Um, one of the challenges we had with this was when you're dealing with a new vendor, your, your predictive modeling tool may not actually have the, uh, the equipment you're wanting to use in their database. Um, Ekahau at least had MIST's AP41 in it, and, and I was able to work with that. Um, ended up using their smaller uh, two by two AP in, in a bunch of locations. But even getting antenna patterns from MIST was a bit of a challenge. Uh, it wasn't for a lack of people who understood what was going on, what I, what I was asking for, because uh, uh, most of my SE team had, had recently come over from Aruba. But rather, it was kind of more of a startup culture of, of secrecy around the product and not wanting to reveal all the special sauce. Um, I eventually did get what I needed, and um, I'm happy to say that now as of uh, the 923 release of Ekahau, that the other APs are now part of the uh, part of the, um, the database. So you may recall I said that my timeline here was a little tight. I had about two weeks to get the main public areas turned up. I'd already chewed through a couple of days getting the design done. 
The church had already paid us for the hardware, put a deposit down on our labor. I booked my travel, and now I needed some hardware. I ended up uh, picking 10 of their connectorized APs for the uh, sanctuary with some uh, patch antennas from Exceltex and a, uh, a handful of uh, internal antenna APs for the, uh, for the public spaces outside. Now, this is where we get into layer zero. Um, remember, we're in Indiana. It's March. And if you've been to Indiana in March, we need to talk about brackets. Okay, not that kind. You talk about brackets to, to Hoosier in, in March, and, and this, is, this is all they think about. Um, so, so, so we had to figure out what's, what's going on with the, with the brackets. Um, MIST has three brackets. One is, a, um, is for a T-bar, one is for drywall, one is a threaded rod bracket. Um, if you live in the Cisco world, this may look a little familiar to you. Uh, I had not come from the Cisco world, so I wasn't familiar with these options at all. Um, the T-bar the bracket we discovered does not work with, um, with ceiling tiles that, drop, that are offset to drop down below the grid. Uh, so that was, that was out. We ended up having to use the drywall bracket to mount these things in the middle of the ceiling tile. If you're in California, that probably won't fly with coat. Um, these APs are not light. Uh, and then the threaded rod bracket goes at the end of a 5 8 inch rod um, for, um, for dropping down. So... I placed the order on a Wednesday with our distributor, 20 APs, a bunch of brackets, uh, a few extras just to, just to kind of mix it up and, and get a few, few extras of everything just in case we had to make some changes on the fly. And I, I tell my distributor, I need these things to be here next Wednesday at the absolute latest. That's when we're doing the install. No problem. I think you see where this is going. Uh, I even offered to pick them up at the distributor's warehouse in Chicago because I was going through Chicago on my way to the site. Um, this is where I learned that our distributor doesn't actually stock anything uh, in terms of the, uh, the MIST product. Uh, this is a similar model to the way Meraki does things. Um, this is a distributor I've been working with to get all my ruckus gear and they stock that. And so I figured, okay, I'll just, I'll just go by and pick it up. You know, no problem. Um, so what they, what they do is they just take my order and then pass it on to MIST's own logistics in California, um, so I'm trying to figure out, okay, what, what value is the distributor adding, adding here? But you know, I, I dealt with this with, with Meraki before, so it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, so it's an install week. I'm on my way to Indy. The APs are on their way to Indy. The client's got a boom lift. Our cabling contractor is in place. Um, everybody's ready to do their thing. Wednesday morning arrives, and I start going through all my stuff and making sure everything is in place. And then, Nobody at the church had received any shipments tagged for us. And so I'm starting to panic here. I mean, it's, I've got three days to get this done. Um, so I, I, I call my distributor rep. I call my channel rep. And in between these calls, I'm running around uh, trying to get the cable guys going and doing all this work. A few hours later, I get a call back from my distributor rep. says, yep, they're on a truck. They're headed your way. Okay, great. When are they getting here? <laughs> Next Monday... I'm going to be back home at that point getting ready to go to the beach. This is not going to work. And clearly I'm about to need this vacation really badly. So I asked them, what happened to Wednesday at the absolute latest? So more phone calls ensued and they eventually come back and tell me that uh, distribution had told uh, Miss Logistic Provider uh, ground shipping's fine because they figured the ground shipping would get there in time. They neglected to tell them the date I needed it by. The fulfillment people, they saw ground shipping and went, great, this is a 250-pound shipment. Uh, we're just going to put it on a freight truck because that's going to save us a whole heap of money. Um, and hey, the ground shipping, it's a-okay. So at this point, it's early afternoon. Um, if I want any hope of salvaging this trip, I've got to get something in my hands. So I, I, I call my channel rep back and start begging with him. I said, I just don't care how you do it. I need at least a dozen of these APs in my hands tomorrow, first thing. Um, fortunately, Indianapolis is a major FedEx hub. Um, so that's pretty much how day one went. You know, those of you who've done installs remember that uh, the first day is a lot of spinning your wheels. Uh, it doesn't feel like you accomplish anything. Um, so I'd spend most of it on the phone dealing with this logistics snafu. 
Now, to Miss Credit, um, my channel rep did, did a great job with this. Um, when he was faced with a bunch of, well, we're not really sure how to handle this because we've never done it before from his coworkers, um, he impressed on them the importance of uh, this is the new partner's first deployment, and if we don't make this right, it's probably going to be the last one, and we spent way too much time trying to bring this product to market to, uh, to do that. So I finally find out from, yes, there, are, there is a new shipment of APs coming to me, FedEx, tomorrow morning, 9.30 a.m., first thing. Next morning, my antennas, I've been giving them the Krylon touch. They've been drying overnight um, because I was making those invisible. So I head up to the front desk around 9.30 to get my shipment because FedEx is supposed to be there. No FedEx. I call FedEx. FedEx says, yeah, they're out for delivery by 9.30. I said, well, it's 9.45 and your driver's not here yet. And, you know, they give me some lame excuse about the weather, and I'm looking outside at the beautiful sunshine and thinking, okay. So FedEx finally showed up about 15 minutes before lunchtime. Uh, my cabling guys are pretty much done at this point. I'm still not getting any APs hung. I'm down to um, about 24 hours before I've got to get on my flight. Um, did I say a bad word in church? No, but I really, really wanted to. So we, we, we finally get our APs. Uh, I, I finally um, feel like I'm actually getting somewhere. You know, and we had, to, uh, we had to do some skinning on these things to make them disappear up into the, up into the catwalk. It's a ceiling kind of like this one here. Um, we would have loved to send them to Excel Text for skinning, but five to six week turnaround was not gonna work for us. Uh, so we ended up uh, finding a local sign shop and getting some vinyl, and that's where we discovered just what a complete pain in the butt it is to try to skin a curved surface. You guys at Excel Techs, I, hats off to you guys because you make it look easy. Um, so, um, um, yeah, dealing with those little antenna connectors was, was kind of a fun little trick. Um, so once we got the APs ready, uh, it was time to hang them. And then they tell us, oh, by the way, you can't get into the sanctuary between 3 and 7 p.m. because there's a rehearsal. Okay. Uh, this, again, is, is contention in layer zero. Um, we're having to share the space with somebody. At least we weren't trying to do it the week before Easter, which in a church is what's also known as a change freeze. Uh, so I go and hang some APs on the outside, and hopefully that's going to you know, fill up three hours. And so we finally got these APs in, we started hanging them, uh, and this is where it really comes in handy to be both the uh, designer and the installer. Uh, my predictive design, I'd put these things about 15 feet further towards the back of the room, uh, whereupon I discovered that actually installing them there and being able to maintain them long term was a absolute non-starter, and we just really had no nowhere to hang them from uh, that wasn't completely impractical. So I actually just moved the whole thing back about 15 feet and hung them off the uh, theatrical catwalks. Um, I was able to hang the, the antenna brackets easily enough with these beam clamps that you can see. Um, but the APs, that was not going to work because um, it's hard to tell from the picture, but that beam there is about an inch thick, uh, which was the maximum opening of that beam clamp. And um, so what I did is I ended up just putting these APs, laying them on the catwalk upside down um, with, with the uh, connectorized APs on these things. The BLE array is still actually internal, so you still have to mount them like, like they're, they're an Omni. Um, so we just decided we're going to go without the, uh, the BLE capability for a little while. Um, so the antenna mounting was, was, was pretty easy. Um, this was a lot easier with the boom lift. Another little trick I discovered here, when you're uh, aligning a 60 degree antenna, if you have uh, one of the, uh, the two camera iPhones, that 2X camera happens to be almost exactly 60 degrees. So if, if you just kind of aim it with your iPhone with the camera, it kind of gives you a, a, a sight picture that you can use, which, which is tremendously helpful. Uh, and I actually even had one of the, uh, the lighting designers at the church uh, take, a, take a plot and actually draw a 60 degree circle uh, on, on the plot to show me where I need to name these things. Uh, so that was really helpful because the lighting people knew exactly how wide 60 degrees was in that space. So, uh, so yeah, I was, I was spent most of that day up on the lift, um, and these guys, while they were rehearsing, actually sang some song about lifting me up, which 
I don't know if that was on purpose or not, but it was, it was kind, of, kind of humorous while I was up there. Um, so I make my flight. I needed this after that week. I was, I was beat. I was frustrated. I was, I was ready for, for a vacation. So fast forward to a month later, um, the original shipment of AP showed up about the time I was leaving for my flight. So they actually got there, quote unquote, early. Um, now we've got 20 extra APs that we don't know what to do with. Um, so uh, one of the other complications of this logistical snafu is that at the time, missed uh, accounting did not actually have a, pro a process or a procedure for dealing with RMAs because nobody had ever done it. Um, we ended up sitting on these things for couple of months, I think it was late July before they finally figured out how to take them back. So now we're ready for the rest of the install. Uh, we know we've got the gear, it's, it's sitting there, it's been sitting there for a month, um, but this time I don't have the lift. Now, remember the brackets? We're, we're going to be dealing with the, the threaded rod brackets. Um, now th these take a 5 8 inch uh, threaded rod. If you're uh, from Europe or some other place that uses the metric system, they do have a metric version for you. Uh, so don't feel too left out by our, our weird American measuring system. Um, here's the catch with 5 8 inch rod. Have you ever tried to find any? Home Depot doesn't carry anything over half an inch. Um, Granger and Fastenal, it's a special order item. Um, I, tr I briefly concocted some grand plan of using Unistrut to do this. Well, it turns out the holes in the Unistrut are also built for half inch or smaller. Um, Layer zero, strikes again. And then I had somebody at Fastenal come up with these wonderful little devices. It's a little insert that goes into a 5 8 inch hole and has a 3 8 inch hole in the middle of it and some convenient thread lock. Five pack of these, 10 bucks, which solved a whole lot of problems because you can get 3 8 inch stuff all day long, everywhere. So, those of you that know me real, really well, um, I have a raging case of ADHD. I'm sure I'm probably the only one in the room like this, but um, one of the quirks of this is that I hate being interrupted in the middle of something. When I'm, I, got, I got my groove going, I'm moving, I'm moving, and something interrupts me and it just drives me crazy. Well, Tuesday morning, my phone starts buzzing like crazy. And I'm like, oh God, something's, something's going wrong with, with, with the vendor and I'm gonna have just another mess to deal with. And finally I come to a stopping spot. I pull out my phone and Twitter has just exploded. Well, apparently um, somebody had given me this thing called a CWNE that morning and well, Twitter went nuts. <laughs> So I, I thought it was kind of fitting that, that I got my CWNE while I was actually in the middle of, of hanging APs and, and, and doing, uh, doing a job. And uh, so that was, that was kind of a cool thing. So, um, but yeah, it, uh, at first it was kind of, oh, well, who wants me now? So, you know, this, this is some, some of the, um, the magic um, assembly I had to do with, with these brackets, you know, with some rod and some... Uh, these beam clamps, and it's, it's really over-engineered to death. Um, one of the uh, things that I was not able to do with these APs is there's, no, there's nowhere to attach a safety chain to these things, so I've got to really hope that these screws hold. Um, I went through a rather alarming amount of Loctite and making sure that everything was going to stay put because these, these rafters, uh, they've got subwoofers hanging from them. Uh, it gets pretty loud in there when, when they get going on a Sunday morning. And so it's, uh, there, there's definitely some vibration potential. So I, I'm, you know, at this point, I'm, I'm hoping that it, it stays put. And if nothing else, you know, the patch cord may, uh, may hold it in place. Um, so this is kind of the assembly that we had there. And of course, the, the last step is, uh, you know, validation. You know, make sure that, uh, that this is, is working as, uh, as advertised. Um, you know, I, I turned off 2.4 on most of these uh, in the sanctuary. Uh, for the most part, I, I did let the mist uh, back in actually handle the channel and power levels. Um, like Bob said, it's, uh, it's one of those things where you, you kind of want your hand off the wheel, but not too far. And so if, if it decided to do something stupid, we were ready to smack it and, 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 and kick some sense into it. Um, but yeah, we went and did a quick validation survey around it, uh, make sure we didn't have any holes. 
Uh, this is where I discovered that um, when you're surveying in a preschool and you have rooms where the light switch is on the opposite side of the room from the door, that shins are a great way to detect hidden tables. And you, know, you see my rig there. This would have been a whole lot easier with the sidekick, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't until um, a couple months later that I got that. So in conclusion, um, learned a lot from dealing with, uh, with new vendors. Um, number one, your SE relationships are worth everything. Um, if you don't have a good relationship with your SE, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to end well for anybody. Uh, number two, be flexible. You know, you, you've got to, you've got to be able to, uh, to handle these changes on the fly as, as they crop up. Uh, if you're a solo consultant uh, and you're bidding this out and trying to figure this out, just remember that the first couple of jobs are going to take about twice as many hours as you think they will. And it probably wouldn't hurt to plan on an extra, extra doubling of those hours just in case. The stuff that's going to throw you is all that little stuff. It's, it's not going to be, you know, hey, this AP isn't working. Um, it's silly things like mounting hardware, getting cable to where you need it to get, uh, getting access to the AP locations, um, and the supply chain. But related to that is understand how your vendor's supply chain works. Because if you don't know how to work within that particular constraint, uh, it's going to bite you in the butt just as much as not understanding uh, the technical constraints of the hardware. The vendors, they need an engineering feedback loop for their customers. Um, after, uh, after this project was done, I spent uh, several hours on the phone doing a hot wash with their engineers and talking about my experience with these, um, with these brackets and, and what they could have done better on that. Um, and, and that's just kind of part of your part of your SE relationship. If you got an SE, they can they can get you that pipeline to engineering and get that feedback because that's how the product gets better. Uh, and that that works for hardware. That works for software. You know, you also need you also need to have a vendor that's willing to understand that when you tell them their baby's ugly, that maybe they need to to actually look at it and and realize that okay, yeah, there's some there's some things we can fix here. And don't necessarily stick to one vendor because. Um, just because that's what you've always done, you know, branch out a little bit. Um, there's there's some cool technology that's always coming out out there. Um, so you know, if, if somebody comes along, you know, check out the new technology, learn that new technology, and, and try to find out how it can fit into your um, into your customers' needs. And then related to that is knowing what your uh, what your vendor's specific niche is. What do they do really really well? Um, because that's, that's going to help you select a, a, a product for a particular customer uh, that, that meets their needs. So questions, criticisms, clever ideas, it, I, I'll take envelopes of cash if you got them. Uh, otherwise, I am on Twitter at Canardian, and um, there's my email address. I'm not going to spell it out for you because it's a mouthful. Um, that's... Anybody got any questions? Witty comments? No? Okay.